I know. It's so great when people start popping up, not just their um, screen names, but their faces across the top. If you can see them coming in, Linda. I can, and I love seeing all these people. <laughs> so it is pouring down rain up here today. What's it like down there? It's not quite pouring, but I am hoping it's going to start pouring because our grass is about as brown as I've ever seen. It looks like hay. Really? We've oh, yeah. Had, we've had a nice mix of rain and not. But as you know, I had to flee my house because my husband has COVID. And I do not have a copy of your amazing book, nor was I going to actually, I was going to show the screen, the stack of Linda Reef books, because you are my go-to person. Um, I honestly, Linda, I have learned so much from you that I take into my classroom and it all works. That's the thing, right? Everything you've ever suggested to me has made a difference in my teaching. And that is a body of work that I am so grateful for. Oh, that is so sweet of you to say that. Well, the feeling is mutual because the more you and I talk and the more you and I work together, the more I learn from you, the more I you know, start rethinking mm -hmm. a few things um, and just wanna tweak things a little bit differently to make it better for kids. So. Isn't that constant in our work, constant, constant. as yeah. teachers? And, you know, if anybody on here doesn't know, you retired after 40 years teaching eighth graders the same <laughs> age, 40 years. I loved eighth graders. I oh, miss them. And no, they I miss you. What did you miss I, about them? Give us a few things. What did you miss? Well, you know what I miss? I miss their energy, but I also miss their... Um, They've had this kind of complacent attitude, like, try to make me do this. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Or try to make me see how important this is. And, and I miss that with them. Um, you know, I miss their, they're really positive about a lot of things, but then, then they just turn so negative sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're constantly never really knowing what they're going to be like when you're working with them. I mean, oh, I, sure. the, the, I swear the last week I was there and I was still working really hard to get this one young woman. Um, I'm going to have to make up a name just in case, uh, Julie, she was either, she did everything to the best of her ability or she just plain did nothing. She decided mm. I'm not doing that. I don't like it. I'm not doing that. So <laughs> I'm standing out in the hall with her. And I, I said, you know, you have so much potential. What is it I could have done differently that would have helped you be more successful for this whole year? And she just, she does her best eighth grade stance with hand on the hip, staring at the ceiling, looking back down at me. And she just looks at me and says, it's tough working with adolescents, isn't it? <laughs> it's just walked away <laughs> but, oh. oh yes it is and i still i really love it most days yeah. so it's so funny you know i was thinking about how unpre unpredictable eighth graders are i walked into my classroom the first year i was back um in an eighth grade i'd been at the uh campus in eastern michigan teaching pre-service teachers right first time back in five years into regular eighth grade and it's April Fool's Day, which I have no knowledge of, except that I walk in my classroom, my students have taken our author's chair, this big stuffed pink and white chair, and put it right outside my window on the front lawn of the school. <laughs> and, I walk in, I'm like, Who? and they are hysterical, right? They're just yeah. such kids inside. At yep. the same time, they were so darn serious sometimes, right? Because life got very serious for them. I always felt like eighth graders could feel they were on the brink, right? Yeah. A big transition. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's the same. I, I mean, I can think of eighth graders that actually had little matchbox cars that they would play with when oh, yeah. nobody was um, paying any attention to them. And so you've got kids playing with toys, but yeah. you've also got kids who are um, really looking at college catalogs already. So there's such a mix, such a mix. I think that's what I loved about them. So 
we are here today because you have just released a new book. Okay, I'm holding it up because you told me you don't have it, even though I, I get embarrassed doing this, but I'll hold it up. <sighs> it's beautiful. Look at those leaves kind of fluttering across the cover. I know. I love what they did with the cover. They did a, a really great job. Okay, so Whispering in the Wind. Yes. And the subtitle is about deeper reading and writing. Through poetry. Through poetry. Yeah. yeah. Well, what I learned, yeah, I mean, part of this is what I learned from you that I'm in, even if I'm reading novels, I'm mm -hmm. always looking for the poetry within the context of that writing. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not just about looking at poems. It's, it's looking at the way somebody phrases something that they capture something in a way I've never read it that way before. And you Very can nice. see something and feel something that you may have never seen or felt before. So um, I, I just, I, I want kids to start reading. I wanted them to start reading that way. Think about what do you notice about the language uh -huh. um, that author put this together, that it really captures your attention. So um, at the center is this idea of heart books. So what are they? Well, yes. Um, I just kept thinking, I mean, the whole story actually centered on um, Georgia Hurd's heart maps. Mm -hmm. And I had put her heart maps, I had put them all together as a quilt. Um, and they were right outside our door before you come into the classroom. So kids, if they had to wait a couple of minutes while all the kids were leaving, yeah. would be looking at each other's and getting ideas for writing because that's Georgia intended those heart maps actually is helping kids find writing. Um, those things that went to the heart of who they were. And so I was looking at those one day and I thought, you know, doggone it, I cannot get the kids to actually pick up poetry books on their own, despite the fact I've got hundreds of anthologies here. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, what if we started crafting heart books, meaning a blank book, similar to a notebook or a journal. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a separate book from a notebook or journal, but I'll tell you why it is and why it worked better for me doing it that way. I wanted them to start reading poetry um, and paying attention to the language of poetry so they could start to find it in the poetry of their novels or essays uh -huh. that they were reading and that they were writing. So I just got a bunch of blank books and I thought, all right, what if we eat, we only had 45 minutes. I only had the kids for 45 minutes. And I thought I'm gonna have to figure out a way to use this during transition times. I'll spend three or four days showing the kids how to do a double page spread find the poetry that you love. I'll introduce them to in the same way that you do with um, kind of book clubs. I'll introduce them to a number of different poets yeah. um, and different kinds of poetry. And we'll do a first double page spread together in the blank book. I'll teach them a couple of art invitations. And then I'm just going to leave them in the room. Here's LA1, LA2, and here's all the poetry books. Here is all the materials for the art invitations that you might want to try. But by the end of the year, um, you should have maybe seven double page spreads in this blank art book. And that they, include a poem that I have chosen. Correct. Some kind of art around that poem. Right. And yep. is there something else that I'm writing with it? Well, yes, I'm, I'm asking the kids just to write, you know, what did you notice about this poem and what made you choose it? I, I don't want them to do an analysis of it. We, we didn't even talk about an analysis of it. We just thought about, you know, occasionally we would talk about craft moves, but I started out by introducing them to some poets that I wasn't sure they would know about. And they were poets in the area, like, like Charles Simic was one and they didn't know about Charles Simmons. Most kids know yeah. Shel Silverstein and Robert Frost, but I wanted them to know contemporary poets like Clint Smith. Um, so I introduced them to poets I, I was pretty sure they wouldn't know, but then I just showed them here are all of those poetry collections. 
So now the reason I like this separate from their notebook is it stays in the classroom for the whole year. It doesn't leave the classroom. So when can you work on it? All during these transition times. We've got two days before we go on Thanksgiving break and you don't wanna start something new with the kids. You are coming back from a vacation and you wanna get them back into mm. the reading and writing mm. again. So I'll say, you know, just pick up your hard book or the kids, I, I can't even begin to count the number of standardized tests that we had to give kids um, over and over and over. And there were always kids sitting there for two and three days with nothing to do yeah. because they weren't they weren't supposed to be doing anything except that testing. And I said, all right, your heart books are right there. Grab your heart book. You totally finished this test. It was supposed to be three hours long, but you were done in 17 minutes. Yep. So you now have two and a half hours um, that you can work on the heart book. So I, mm. I kept it separate from their notebooks because it stayed in the classroom and it, it had a structure to it that yeah. was, it was built around a lot of choice, but it also had a structure to it that the kids knew exactly what they could be doing on their own. So I didn't have to be directing them. You don't um, get like that you said, for one, they needed seven two page spreads over the course of the year. And I think sometimes we put such unreasonable pressure on ourselves, like, yeah. oh, I better make it once a month. And then you're always yep. like rushing kids through things, but seven in a year, I mean, I could as a student get really engaged in one and then leave it for a while. And, and, and that time, when you say I've got time to work on it, could be spent entirely me looking through poetry books for a poem that really grabs me. Right. right? Yeah. And, and everything, Penny, that they did in that, they could have done that in their notebooks too. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, though, those notebooks were going back and forth with them. And there were times when they weren't in the classroom. But by keeping those hard books in the classroom, yeah. there was something constantly there for them to be working on. That mm -hmm. I mean, I just, there were so many times that I saw in other classrooms, somebody would pull out a word puzzle uh -huh. during these transition times. And I just kept thinking, this has got to be worthwhile work. That is not worthwhile work. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be something set up for the year that the kids can be working on that, that matters to them. Mm -hmm. um, and there, at the very beginning of doing this, I said to the kids, when you hear the word poetry, what goes through your head? And kids would go, oh, no, 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 no. We're not doing a poetry unit, are we? Please tell us no. Um, and they would give me all these horror stories about three-week poetry units. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, no, no. Um, this is really your choice. I'm going to introduce you to some poets, but I yeah. want you to pick the ones that you love the most. And I would like you to try this double-page spread. Um, I mean, I think the other thing, you and I have talked a lot about this, that creativity is at the top of that Bloom's taxonomy. Yep. And yet, where do we give kids the chance to be truly creative? And I thought, I, I want them to extend their notion of what they take from this poetry from words to art. And so I'm going to show them some contour drawing. I'm going to show them some watercolor. Um, one of the kids actually taught me Zentangles. I looked yeah. at what she was doing and I went, what is that? And she said, oh, those are Zentangles. And she, she taught me what what they were. Um, I started looking at Ralph Fletcher's book, um, Focus Lessons About Photography, and I was online looking at how, now I can't, Park Salas is the young man's name, but using iPhones to really take some stunning photographs, and I thought every kid has an iPhone. Um, they should be able to take some photographs. They can turn them into watercolor. They can use them as they are. Yep. But, but let's look at how do you extend your notion of what you took from this piece of poetry into art that further enhances your thinking about this poem? Well, um, it's funny because someone said, you know, what are Zentangles? And I just wrote Google Images and they'll blow your mind because there are different oh, yeah. per, per kid, the number of ways you can combine them. And I used right. to do that heart, you know, in their notebooks. 
yeah. you know, your imprint, you're holding this book and then cover it in Zentangles. And they were all as different as the kids yeah. are. But the other thing I like that you said, and I was looking over here because I got two sitting here by my computer, the art postcards technique that you've taught kids to sketch yeah. the corner of a postcard, yes. right? Yeah. Can you say more about yeah. that? I'm going to grab two right here. Yeah. Um, I love doing that because it it really gets them to dig kind of deeply into what do you see, what do you notice yes. when you're drawing it. Because years ago, I used to just have them write in response to the postcard. Oh, that's a great one. Isn't that oh, amazing? That. It's yes. an artist in Portland, Oregon, and he does pages. You can see on here, it's a page from a book or a dictionary, and then he sketches yeah. on it and around it. I love doing that. Right, yeah, so you I can love take one corner and just sketch like the feet if you're feeling nervous. Yep. That's yep. what I like about it because my students would say I can't draw, and I'd say, but you're just looking at one corner. Yeah, just, just a so little smart. Yeah, yeah, and another one. Look at this one. I told you about her. Be oh, some you know, These are quotes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But you can and sketch one corner of this. Did I did I show you what I? Oops, I just I just dropped it. But after you sent me that. Yeah. Okay, this is what I did from it. <gasps> Look I at said, you. I loved this, but I took the one, I did exactly what you're talking about. I just really focused on this one little guy. And then I just drew him and then started writing all around it. And what did but you that, write around it? Well, so, just things I had learned from an interview somebody did with um, her. And then I also, I took the question that you had asked on a Twitter, how often do we give students time and space to create works of art um, or even to study how others do it? And I started writing about how many times um, did my kids actually do some pretty phenomenal artwork, like, I don't know, designing quilts yes. in response to reading Anne Frank, the Holocaust, yep. um, in response to moon journals. And I kept thinking about the um, Thread of Life, the musical nice. that our kids wrote and uh. produced. You know, and, and I thought, we don't do enough of that. We just don't do enough of that. Well, I tell so, you, because at my high school, art was so limited, number of slots in an art class, that kids would tell me the only time they ever did any sketching was in their writer's notebook when they were in my classroom, doing those wow. art postcards that you were talking about or calendar postcards. Yeah. So, you know, people are commenting about how amazing it is, but I think one of the things you just showed us is the power of the teacher engaged in the work you're asking kids to do. Yes, and absolutely. I was writing this morning, we must practice what we teach. You know, you'll yeah. practice what you preach. We have to practice it. I'm inspired just watching, look, hold up your notebook and I go, oh, I want to go do that. <laughs> well, the thing, the thing that I think it, what it says to kids is this must be important enough work for me to do if if I'm willing to take the time or you you my teacher are willing to take the time to do it too yeah. it has to be important work and I think that's the value of the minute we're doing pieces of it and it doesn't mean that we're incredibly successful right at at the drawing or it doesn't mean it's successful yeah. at the writing it's, it may not be a published piece but at least we're we're finding our way into that writing and reading that we're asking kids to do. I love that, finding your way. Do you remember that Don Murray said, when you're writing, like think of your brain as two parts, one where you're composing and one where you're thinking as a teacher, what am I doing? Yeah. When I was making a list this morning, um, the first line is hard to write because the menstrual text is so tightly written. I'm, I'm writing next to a poem which is a product of revision, but I'm in the downdraft. So I have a hard time getting going because my first line is so sloppy compared to the yeah. text. And to remind myself again, that it's hard for kids to get going when they feel like they're standing next to something that's so perfect and why we have yeah. to do that writing. And then I put, remember show not tell is for teaching, not just for writing, right? We have to show them what writers do. Yeah. And the last thing I wrote was, I was writing next to a line. Um, you would love this line. It's a book from that Gray Wolf Press, Prognosis. The eagle perched above the river far below, the heart permanently broken, 
the small stone wall falling apart, the weeds in the cracks of the wall and everything else, mother, that you missed in your unhappiness. Uh, and I went, see, yeah. oh, and I started making a list. What did you miss in yeah. your unhappiness? And I wrote the way I studied my opponent across the net, rereading the shots, springing to meet them, the many, many times I won. Did you ever see the shy confidence sweep my face as I sprinted to the net to shake hands? Not once, <laughs> right? That's the response to what did you miss? And then as I wrote it, here's the thing that matters. All of the times that mom and dad were there came back. Yep. That until what, I started, I, until I started listing them. what mom missed, right. I'd forgotten. And I went, there's the gift of writing. Because yep. now I remember those moments that I want to treasure and want to write right. about. Well, you know, and what that reminds me of, Penny, is, is what you remember talking about from Kim Stafford, how one of his suggestions was when you're writing in your notebook and you stop writing, go back to that last line that you wrote yeah. yep. and just write up that last line. So what you just wrote almost came from that last line. And that last line is the essence of where you're headed, right? Now. I know. And one time in class this last fall, I told students to go back in their notebooks about two and a half weeks and underline the last line of every notebook practice entry. I said, and just look at, what do you notice? Kid after kid said, I noticed that I really get to good stuff the more I write. Like, right. I, like I gotta right. warm myself up again and again. But yep. they often sit in front of screens and think, I got to get it right. That would stop anybody from starting, right? Exactly. The notebook is this messy place you can keep getting it wrong. Yep. yep. No one has well, shown me that more than you. You just have always been back in your notebook saying, I can, I can do this. Well, that's why I, I mean, I just think we have to let kids understand that it's such a valuable thing for us to do as readers and writers that. Um, we wouldn't be asking them to do it if we didn't seriously think it was that important. Right. And one of the people wrote on here, and this is Jody Stevens. Uh, I remember the week long class I participated in with you in Vancouver, Washington. You taught us postcard art, contour drawing. Jody. You took uh, us yes. to Portland Art Museum, <laughs> nature places. I still have my notebook. I don't know how you got us to try these things, but you did, and it was amazing. Thank you for reminding me that we can do this. And kids- Jody, where are you? Put your picture up there because I remember you. Yes, hello. Hi. I still look at that, that notebook and I think, I don't know how she got us, that we were so afraid to do these things. You had us get all the art supplies and the moon journals and, oh my goodness, you, it was amazing. And I still you look know, at that going, how did she get us to do this writing that I didn't know was inside of me? And how can I do that with kids? And I'm still afraid because I don't draw well. But. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember, the, I, I mean, this is a great story, but um, Michael, we were mm -hmm. looking at the sculptures of Dwayne Hansen, who, who does real life sculptures out of, out of metal. Mm. So we were each we each chose one to draw but they look so real that Michael had his notebook open in front of him and he was sketching this couple but another couple came by and started looking at his face because they thought he was part of the sculpture <laughs> and he said he was so afraid to move because he was afraid he would give them a heart attack uh, well, <laughs> so Part of that, it I, it was. Oh, I remember that so clearly, Jody. Yeah, thank you. It's yeah, so I was, thank you for all the gifts. Thank you. I look forward to oh, the book. Great. Yeah, for I'm sure. Thanks for sharing. So, Linda, if I'm in a regular classroom, what I love is that you showed me it's it can be used for transitions. That's what's so genius here. I mean, you and I, we would have kids pull out notebooks lots of times, but there's work involved in I've got to have a of something to to write next to with kids yeah. and I often yeah. had a folder on my desk with lots of those options for those moments that I didn't know what to do with but what's beautiful about this is it's an ongoing thing where if you said go get your heart books I can so see my students being like oh phew there's a sense of this is not pressure it's an invitation yeah. And well, I love you, know, that. you know, it was actually, um, it, it was a bonus as part of this. 
the other teachers, science, social studies, math, every mm -hmm. time the kids finished something, the math teacher would say, go get your heart book. Or so the they social got to see them too, though. That's really great. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh... And, you know, so even though they weren't doing them, they knew full well what the kids had those available to them. And it was great to hear, have the science teacher say, um, I'm getting three kids heart books. They, they need something to work on. Um, awesome. So it, it was terrific as a team. Hmm. So we're coming up on the end of our time together. And I had asked if people had questions, which I haven't seen any questions in here. I could be missing one. And we have a small enough group you can unmute if you want to and ask your question. But I see some hellos from like Reno for one. Um, uh -huh. And somebody mentioned the writing is totally cathartic. I, I agree so much. There are so many times that the writing myself settled me into the work of the day as a teacher. Yep. Yep. Me too. Um, I think there's an obvious question out there, Linda. Did you grade these? Um, you know, I actually, um, I didn't so much grade them as I did. Um, it was done or not done. Mm -hmm. And it just counted toward, um, you know, if somebody had, they had finished it, they'd finished five. And by the way, even though I said, you're going to try to do seven double page spreads, mm -hmm. there were some years that there were only five. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, there were other things that we got in the way and this was not absolutely essential. Yep. Um, so um, it, it didn't matter. They had seven, they had done five. You but know, they could, they I could make show. the difference. Yeah. Do you have one? Um, I'm just thinking. I just mentioned she has the coolest office, you guys. You can't see, but down that little hall where she is, there's a sauna. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. You're All right. killing so this. I've got mine. This is mine. It was. It's mm -hmm. a blank book, um, and we got them for like three dollars at um, Barely Books. And this was. All right. There's one of my double page spreads. Wow. I picked um, a war okay, poem. Hold it. I'm going to unpin me so that they can really see yours. There we go. Okay. Tell me what's on here. Is that your dad? Okay. So this is my dad who um, landed on Normandy um, and absolutely paid the price of everything he saw happening. And one of the reasons I told the kids that I had actually sliced up the picture is because it felt like he was a broken person um, for the rest of his life because of serving in World War II and always wondering why he had not died on those beaches of Normandy with many of his buddies. Mm. So my writing has to do with everything I learned from my dad and how much he suffered through it. But that's, that's what a double page spread. Um, so it looks like you have three poems on there. Well, I put three because I couldn't stop myself <laughs> um, putting poems on there. But this one, I had a Robert Frost. These are photographs that I took. Mm. Um, and then again, my response to um, what I noticed about the pictures. And I, I mean, I was trying everything that I was asking the kids to do. Um, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't work. Sometimes we did a collage. And I had had the kids make all kinds of paper that we saved and shared with each other. Wow. And Beautiful. so this is, this is paper that the kids actually um, made and did watercolor on. And I just grabbed strips of it and had it. It just worked really well with a Naomi Shiab Nye poem, mm. um, gate A4. So that's, I mean, a double page spread, that's pretty much what the kids were working on the whole year. That's what it looked like. Well, it's interesting because um, someone just asked, Jody asked if it's different than the two page spreads I talk about where I ask kids to collect passages from literature, right? These are different. These are very personal, right? Yeah. And yeah. I'm, you're just making me want to add this to my notebook thing for the fall because I only have them fall semester. I might say two two page spreads in the fall. But what I love is you are inspiring me to try all these different ways I might work it out to be ready yeah. to show my students in the well, fall. 
I mean, I think what, what is valuable is you can do two page spread just in their notebooks. You could say, you know what, maybe once a, a quarter, if there's one piece of poetry you find that you absolutely love and you do a double page spread from it, it doesn't have to be a separate heart book, um, but there is a reason for the heart book that I had them separate. And there could be a reason for you to do it too, but there are also many reasons for doing it in the notebook you have. Will you show us a couple more? Um, um, I know you have directions in the book for exactly what goes in the two page spreads are very open, but at the same time, choice and structure yeah. kind of hand in hand. Well, I, what I, what I love about the book that they did a beautiful job on is, I don't know if you can see, this is Max. Nice. And so that's his heart map. And this happens to be one of his double page spreads. So I, I oh. hope that's really you can see what that looks like. Great examples um, for kids. Yeah, no, there were, there were, look, this is, um, you know, and these are kids who keep saying to me, I can't draw. Look at and that. I know, look at that puppy, <laughs> um, all the drawing. They, the important thing is that you're giving kids choice. And here's the Zen tangle. Um, oh, look at that narwhal with the Zentangle. Yep. Um, so wow. some of the heart maps um, that weren't part of the double page spread, but they happen to be in the book, just so you can see what some of the double page spreads look like. Um, what amazed me is that the kids were choosing contemporary as well as classic poets. And um, like yeah, someone the, asked the, about spoken word. Could they use spoken word? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and also what I would I say at the end of this book is, I think I could, just a great thing that you could do is have the kids go back to what they think is the poem they love the most uh -huh. and, and make a video, make a two Very to three cool. video. Um, yeah. So I do, I've, I've listed about eight or nine um, poetic videos at the back mm. of the book that have been pretty powerful in showing the kids those. Um, yeah, doing it digitally. Um, I love it. This, uh, Deb Bass O'Brien said, add a QR code to the page. She is a 2022 oh, book love winner, by the way, which is awesome. <laughs> and this, at the back of the book, um, I, I put in the five different art invitations nice. and how to teach those to the kids in the simplest way, because I don't feel like an art teacher at all. But even doing watercolor, doing torn, um, torn pages. Um, what a gorgeous oh book Heinemann put together for you there. And they did. They color. did a great job. That's the Zen Tangle. Yeah. Um, Zen Tangle. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's lots in this that you could use in many, many different ways. It doesn't have to be in that one particular way. I loved it. Somebody said right after lunch, and I immediately thought of this tough block I had at the high school of sophomores that was right after lunch. Man, I wish I'd had this thing. I would have, you know, we did a lot of notebook writing. I worked really hard to get them reading after lunch, but I feel like this would have been an invitation to do yeah. that. Yeah. And then let's yep. get back together work. I don't know. There's something really cool about putting watercolors and, and little cups of water on the table. The kids come in and go, oh, what are we doing? What are we doing? <laughs> I mean, they get really excited about it. Yeah. I think I've told you there was a time when um, I was sitting at my desk in June and a student came back into my room and he said, Miss Kittle, and I had him as a sophomore. He was a senior cap and gown, practice the whole bit. Do you have that bear I drew in my notebook by any chance, right? And do you remember I told you I had taken a picture of it because I thought it was so beautiful. I was like, I have it. And I was able to print it for him and he was just delighted. And he goes out the oh, door. Oh, that is said, great. How does he remember that? I know. At one time, you know, I remember because it had been pouring down snow and most of the kids hadn't arrived at school and I had done the art, you know, choose a, a corner or, and that's, we need stuff for those transition times that like you said, doesn't make it feel like it's a waste of time, but it's something they're creating something yeah. that be lasting and beautiful and important to them. Yep. Well, I just, I ran into one of my, one of the kids who's in here um, he's at one of the local markets working yeah. on, on the farm. And he, he just said to me right away, I still have my heart book. <laughs> he's a sophomore in college. But it, it was almost like he had to get it in really fast. Mm -hmm. I still have my heart book. 
I love that. Can you imagine how many kids are wandering around Exeter that you taught? Or sorry, Durham, Oyster River. Durham. Yeah. So I many know. kids. I know. I, I just, um, I really, I'm envious of people who are still in the classroom. Well, actually. you're going to come visit mine this fall, aren't you? Yes, I am. I think and you're going to, I think I know, we're going to have so too much fun. About that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Ah, Linda Reith, it's always a thrill to see you. Someone on here asked if you'd come back and do a little art invitation with the group. Lead us Ooh, that would art. Be that might fun. be interesting on Zoom. That'd be really fun. We should figure that out. Everybody could bring watercolor, a little watercolor paper, and I could show you what. Yes, that would be great fun. Uh, I love that idea. So we uh, can definitely add this in. We could even wait until August if you want, because we teach at UNH next week, for those of you who don't know. And um, because the Mighty Networks will continue forever. So we could add it in, a little art invitation. Yeah. Well, yeah. Jody, make sure you say hello to everybody that I might know in Vancouver. Sky, Bledso, and Paul Warner. I oh, my goodness. Them. Yes. I'll say hi. <laughs> For sure. That's awesome. Well, thank you all so much. A little bit of your uh, Monday afternoon spent with the mighty Linda Reef is always good for my soul. And Whispering in the Wind just came out. I'm thrilled that it's out in the world. And um, thank, you, thank you. So many people are saying thank you in the chat. If you're not watching it, Linda, best part of the day, Leslie said. Love it. Oh, that is so nice. It was so nice to have all of you here. Absolutely. All right, you guys, you take good care of yourselves. Do a little writing just for you. Enjoy your afternoon. Too. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.